So uh, it's always very funny when I hear this, Sean Stone converted to Islam. And I keep telling them the same thing I told them in Iran. I did not convert to Islam. You cannot change. You cannot convert if you maintain the same God. I did not change gods. What I did was I accepted Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet, last prophet. <laughs> I like that sound. Uh, I wish yeah, I have to learn uh, Arabic <laughs> and Farsi too. But uh, it's an acceptance of Islam, which is to say, you know, I come from a Jewish bloodline, partly, uh, baptized in the church, Protestant, and accepted in Muhammad. But what the point is that I want, I hope that people understand that we're coming into a new age of, of engagement between each other. And the, the, the problem that I've seen across many countries is the, uh, the, the, way that, uh, the, the way that people basically, they categorize themselves. They put up stereotypes and they put up borders around what is possible and impossible. And they forget that ultimately as the Old Testament says, all man is created in the image of God. And so really, what does that mean? That we are here, all of us, as different colors, different shades, different aspects of that one creator. And the more we can actually rep recognize the creator within each other and respect our fellow man as such, that is, our, that is how we give thanks to God. That is how we praise God. And so the religious practice is a formality, as we know. We are Shia. I accepted Shia Islam because I love Imam Ali, I love uh, Imam Hussein, Ashura, uh, and I love the, I love the fact that the Shia of the <laughs> uh, You know, I think the Shia are the last of the Mohicans, I call it. <laughs> it's it, truly, I, I participated in the, one of the, the uh, songs of Ashura when I was in Iran last, and the beating of the chest, and this amazing energy that we created in, uh, in giving honor to the sacrifice. Because that's what the Shia are about. They stand for the oppressed. They stand for the, for the, the, common, per the common man against empire against tyranny. We don't submit when a Yazid or a Caliph tells us to. And that's what we need in the world. And that's frankly why, even before accepting Islam, my friends who are Shia always said to me, you know, they fear us. They really do. And who, who did he mean? He means the empire, the satanic empire that rules the world. And we can get into that. <laughs> um, but they fear the power of faith. And it's something that you have to earn. It's not something that you can simply claim. You can't simply stand and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Muslim. I have the right, you know, by claiming that, to execute you, to tell you what to do, to tell you what to wear, to, to what to think. That's not your power. God does not empower you to do that. The humility is of Islam is to submit yourself to God, to rectify yourself and be able to say, I stand in relationship to my maker and I answer, to him, and if I can be an image and a model for others to follow, then I'm in the tradition of Shiism. I'm in the tradition of Imam Hussein, who dies, as, who dies, takes upon himself the sacrifice, not as an aggressor, but, in, but being aggressed, his people being terrorized his, and, and being threatened with death. He says, I will, be, I will do what is just, what is righteous, which is the sacrifice of myself. And that's the model that we should follow. This is the nature of Islam to me. It's finding, it's, it's being a model citizen, a model human being, and standing for the, for the rights of the oppressed in this world we live in. But the problem, I would, start, I would start with this. I will start with my personal path, which is to say through faith. How do you earn faith? How do you find faith? You can't simply be, you know, you can be born into a religion, you can be born into the world and say that you have, you know, you believe in something, but you don't know what. How do you find, how do you find God? 
In my case, it was probably in abandoned mental hospitals. It was in uh, one place particularly called House of the Damned. It was an old house in Letchworth Village, which was a mental hospital for kids. And this place was known as House of the Damned because legend had it that a Catholic priest used to systematically kidnap, rape, sacrifice, satanically, young children from this mental hospital. And there were about 20 or 30 kids that were killed in this way. This was done, this was a known legend in that area. It took place probably 40 or 50 years ago, maybe 60. But the house, we wanted to explore it. We wanted to find out for ourselves if, if it was haunted, what lived there. Well, this world becomes the subject of a film I made called Greystone, and inshallah, documentaries to come about it. Because we face their demon possession, I've seen people transformed, you know, demons, jinns, took possession of them, screaming, they, they lost coherence, they lost possession of their, of their bodies. We walked into the house one night on Valentine's Day 2010, myself and my friend Alex, who's also a Shia, uh, Lebanese, and all we had was faith. We had no idea what we were walking into. We had candles, we were going to pray for the souls of the dead, and as we walked to this house we heard demons, we heard laughing, we heard children screaming, alone, abandoned house, howling of wolves, and we kept going on, staying focused, saying, look, we're here to pray, and we, that's all we did. We walked to, through the house, we put down three candles, lit them, and prayed for the souls of the children. Meanwhile, demons are laughing and howling, mocking us. But I did, we didn't fear it. We walked through it, we got out, and a few months later, that house burned down. It wasn't my doing, but there was a, there was, there was a justice to it. God acted. You have to have faith that God will always act as he wills. But you have to have first to have that faith. You have to have that prayer. We prayed for the souls of the children. I think that the souls of the children that were harmed there were released from that place. I believe that the jinns that lived there were exiled. Hopefully they were returned to heaven. But the point is that by going through this path, by facing what is unknown, the only thing you have is the light of your consciousness, the faith in your heart, the ability to carry into these dark places and know that you have a principle to stand upon. Because really, at every moment, we're dealing with the unknown. This is all practice. This is training. You know, you don't have to go look for jinns. You don't have to go into haunted houses to do it. But it's one form of training. It's what, you know, in a sense, it's what Hezbollah does. It's a, it's a, it's a training to find your ability to face what you don't know. Every day now, we're facing a future we don't know. Every moment we can be struck down. Any moment we can be taken from this earth, any moment the economy will collapse completely, we could hit hyperinflation, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, destruction, death. Much of this is prophecy. Much of this may come this year, next year. In any case, we have to face death. It's part of life. But what gives us the courage to carry on? What gives us the seed of the idea that there is a future beyond. And I think that comes from the principle of faith. You see, we live in very dark times. I think everyone knows it. For me, it hit in 2009 in a very particular way, where I said, this is the end of history. Quite literally, it's the end of history as we know it. We were about to, this is right at the, maybe it was 2008, 9, right at the cusp of the economic collapse. Those of us who paid attention to this stuff knew it was coming. But end of history meant something else. It meant that we're entering a new phase of reality, where the world that you assume is normal and ordinary may not be that way tomorrow. The stock market that you think is, you know, will survive could collapse. The housing market, all these, these, these are just very, these are various glimpses of the material collapse taking place around us, but it's, it's, a, it's evidence of something much bigger. It's evidence that we're hitting a transition point in the world. We don't have to rely upon the dictates of old, what the empire tells us, this is the way you should live, 
This is the way you should think. Because frankly, they have no principle. That's why you look around, what do you see? What kind of culture do you see? What kind of insanity and madness do you see? I'll give you an example. Look at Rihanna's video, S&M. This is now, more, this is now common morality. Rihanna, who's a product of the Illuminati, she's Jay-Z's apprentice. Personally, I have some information about that. But the point is that she's basically bought into it as to, as to be an object, an idol of worship, as most of these people are. They've created an iconic, iconic culture, which is complete heresy. It doesn't matter if you're talking Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. It's heretical to put people up as idols. They're not gods. Why do you give them your energy? Do they transform you? Do they uplift you? Rihanna's S&M video, she puts blatantly in, in front of you, Princess of the Illuminati. 